Um, okay, so as we, we talked about last week, there are many directions to take if one wants to find a place for intellectual property in halacha. The most direct route, as it were, is to claim that even though um, halacha normally speaks in terms of uh, tangible property, um, if we could find a source that would indicate that halacha recognizes intellectual property as being property, so then it would be very easy to uh, conceptualize a obligation to respect that. Right? That would be really the neatest route. Um, and it's, it, there are limited sources where one could look for that, but one of them is this Gemara here in Sanhedrin, Dafnuntet. So the Gemara in Sanhedrin tells you that there is a prohibition to... What does the Gemara tell you? Prohibition to what? There's a prohibition for non-Jews to um, to learn Torah, um, and the Gemara in its the Gemara gives two interpretations. It bases it on the pasuk of Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe Morasha Kilat Yaakov, and the Gemara offers two interpretations of the word Morasha. What are the two interpretations it offers? Right. How does this Pasuk prohibit non-Jews from learning Torah? So did we catch, and anyone catch what the Gemara did? So the Gemara said, Morasha can either mean... To us? Correct, right? It's our right inheritance, and therefore it's ours and not someone else's. And the Gemara says, if that's the case, then how do we view a non-Jew who learns Torah? Migzal kagazil, he steals. Right. This is important, to be precise here. The Gemara is second is that the problem is me'orasa. It's as if we're married to the Torah, and therefore this is a violation of our relationship with the Torah. Okay, that's the two options often by the Gemara. And the Gemara contends that there is a chiyuv mita that comes with it, which, as the Ramam clarifies, is not a court-imposed death penalty, but some sort of amorphous, they deserve the death penalty from God, whatever that means. Yes, but the proper girsa here was probably not Ovdiko Chavim, it was probably Goy. Right? But the censor has changed many times when it just said non Jew, Nachri or Goy, to Ovdiko Chavim Umazalo. So it probably didn't originally say that. What? Well, either the Christian censors themselves changed it, or Jews changed it to not offend the Christians, yes. So it probably wasn't originally Ovdiko Chavim Umazalo, that's just what goes in every time it's supposed to say non Jew. Um, yeah. Well, an Obed Kochavim is, right, implies that they're actually active idolaters, right, as opposed to a guy. Now, it, it could be that this prohibition is limited to only some non-Jews. That's possible. I don't want to go and get into a sheer, the second at least, on the prohibition to teach non-Jews Torah, which is a fascinating topic in its own right. Um, why that is, who does it apply to, what type of Torah, what type of non-Jew, um, what if they want to learn, right, is it to actively teach them, is it learning, what's the problem at it? All types of interesting questions there. Um, you know, I remember I was once at a... Um, I've mentioned this story before, but I was once at a, a session where uh, the head of Jewish studies or religious studies at Yale, Christine Hayes, um, uh, was asked this question, because Christine Hayes, as her name implies, is not a Jewish woman. Um, Christine is not the most Jewish name, as things go. Um, but she is um, the head of Jewish studies at Yale, and she is very proficient in Chazal, um, has been the editor of Dine Yisrael, has written many books on Talmud and Midrash. Um, so someone asked her about it, right? How can you learn Talmud when the rabbis themselves prohibit non-Jews from learning Talmud? Um, and she said, well, that's one position in, in the rabbis, but Rabbi Meir says that a Kohen Gadol who studies um, Gemara is ki Kohen Gadol. Now, this is not generally the accepted halakha, or if it is, it's interpreted to mean only certain types of Torah. Um, but I really have no way of figuring out whether a non-Jew is allowed to take a different position in Chazal and paskin like a position that's not normally accepted amongst rabbinic Jews. I don't even know where you would look to figure out that authority question. Um, but that was her answer, at any rate, how she does what she does. Um, but for our purposes... 
why is this why might this be relevant for intellectual property? Right, remember, that's that's the issue here, right? Why might yeah. Exactly. Meaning studying Torah, there's not they're not saying someone who goes into the Aron and takes out a Sefer Torah. They're saying if someone studies Sefer Torah, they're Chayav Mita. And the first formulation of the Gemara is why? What's the nature of the violation? What's the nature of the violation? According to the first position, the Gemara, Zela, it's theft. So some of the Achronim, and this is what you have here, number two in the Machane Chayim, he says, well, Viraya Brurelo said the Shaykh Vichochmag Zela. This is a proof that intellectual property exists and can be stolen. Because that's what the Gemara says. The Gemara asked, why don't you count as one of the Sheva Mitzvot? And the Gemara answered, Right? That it is our Morasha, our inheritance. And it's within theft. Even though we don't lack anything. Or if a non-Jew studies Torah, we don't, we're not missing anything. Since it's our special treasure from heaven, as an inheritance, anyone who utilizes it, takes it to benefit, then he has another chidush, and if someone steals someone else's Torah, so that's a problem. But the point is that Machine Chaim sees in this Gemara a proof, a direct proof, that Halacha recognizes the notion of intellectual property and the ability to steal it and a halachic recognition of that act as theft. And therefore, the Machine Chaim says this is the source for a notion of intellectual property. Okay? So that's model three that we have in terms of recognizing um, intellectual property. Now, obviously, you could reject it and say, well, first of all, the Gemara itself says that it is either Morasha or it's Maorasa, right? That this not, might not be about theft, it might be about something else, right? It might be about a violation of a relationship rather than, and it might be that even when it says theft, it doesn't really mean theft. It means something like theft, or it's a Nasmachta. It's not really clear how seriously to take this Gemara, and that would be an easy rejection of it, but if one wanted to posit a model that directly recognized intellectual property as property that could be stolen, so that's what you would have hidden here in uh, the Machine Chaim's interpretation of Sanhedrin Nuntet. Okay, so that's model number three. Okay? Do we want to break out again in Chavrusa, or do we want to try to work through the next one together? What do we, what do we want to do? Anyone have a preference? Like I said, if you want Chavrusa, we'll do Chavrusa. If you don't want Chavrusa, we'll, we'll, con- we'll learn it together. Whatever, whatever you want. I, I really don't care. What? What? Okay, fine. So, that was model one. The next model, in three and four, um is I want you to think what I'll, I'll give you a hint at what it's going to be and then you can try to prove it but the Gemara is going to indicate uh, that there are certain times where there's something some sort of quasi ownership right meaning what we the first two sources suggest the possibility that intellectually proper intellectual property should be recognized because halacha actually recognized this as a property that can be stolen the next possibility that we're going to see today is a possibility that there are quasi ownerships in halacha, and that it may not be real property, it may not be real ownership and real theft, but there are quasi-models that exist that might explain um, explain it. And that is Shimon Shkup's interpretation of the um, this very small passage from Bava Kama, Chavtet. And again, anything that's in the Gemara, you can, if it's easier for you, you can try to find it on Svaria, or you can struggle through the few lines in Gemara, whatever, whatever you want. Okay, let's take...
seven minutes. Let's let, let's see if we can do it that way. Um, okay, so the second potential model for intellectual property, as I said, the first one that we saw today was a direct claim that you can own, that intellectual property is real and can be stolen and can be owned. Therefore, you can recognize it. The next is to say there's something, there's maybe, it's not quite property, but there is quasi-ownership. And this comes from a Gemara in Bavakama. So the Gemara in Bavakama is a very fascinating claim. And that is, Shnei dvarim einan bershuto shel adam v'asana katuv ki ilohin bershuto. There are two things that are not really yours, but the Torah made them as if they're yours. And what are they? Bor bershuto rabim v'chameit mishay sha'od ulamala. So what are they? Let's take the one you're more familiar with, the second one. Chameitz. Right? Chameitz from six hours and on. Six hours of what? Six hours on. Erev Pesach. Right? So why is that the Gemara's example of something which is Einan Bershuto Shal Adam, which is not really yours, the Asana Katuv Ki Elohim But the Torah makes it as if it is yours. In what sense is that the case? So, in general, you can only own things that have value. Something that has zero value, value at all cannot be owned. What is the status of Hametz on Pesach? It's Asur Be Bahana. Right? Asur Bahana. It's not just prohibited to eat, but it's also Asur to benefit from. Now, if there's something that cannot, you cannot benefit from at all, then it has no value. If it has no value, it cannot be owned. And yet, if you have own, quote-unquote, chametz on Pesach, do you violate an Isur del Raita? Of course. Bal Yira, Bal Yimatze. That's the prohibition. That's why we search for chametz. We get rid of chametz. So the Gemara says, chametz is an example of something that you don't own. Because once Pesach comes, it's prohibited to benefit from it. So it has no value. So it's not owner, right? It's not ownable. And nevertheless, the Torah says that if you own chametz, even though it's not really ownable, we... Make it that you violate. The same is true of Bor Bishud Rabim, where if you go and you dig a hole in the public, um, in public property. So, do you own the public street? No, obviously not. It's the public. And yet, if someone falls into that pit, you are liable. And the Gemara's way of conceptualizing that is that for the purposes of liability, right? If I invited someone into my house into a ginger, dangerous situation and they got hurt, right? That would be my problem. This is my property. Now, I don't actually own the Rishud Rabim, but what we say is that even though it's not yours, if you created this dangerous situation, so we make it as if you're, it's yours in the sense that now you are responsible for the damage that it causes. So based on this, Shimon Shkaf, introduces the following novelty. And he says, look, what you learn in this Gemara is that there are things that may not be ownable, ownable, either because they really belong to the public or because they're not really tangible or have an isur And yet, for certain purposes, in the Gemara's case, on the negative side of the equation, we can make it as if it's yours. So therefore, Shimon Shkab argues in his first piece of Baba Kama, the chen b'vor chiyavto Torah ama mazik shelo izik. When it comes to this pit in the public sphere, so we make you liable. The Torah deems you liable for what you call the damage you caused. And now he pushes it and he says, well, what is it about this pit that made it mine if I can't really own it? So he says, well, the fact that you created it. Right? The fact that you created this damaging right, pit in the middle of the public thoroughfare makes it that you are associated with it and you own it for the purpose of liability. But he says, if it's true of the negative, it might be true of the positive as well. Just like Torah and secular recognize that if you create something, you have rights over it. So, the same thing is true 
They cried early. Isha mechin da gala b'shem balabor balaish. Chayevim he's again at balamazik. Right. So he actually goes in the opposite direction, and he says the existence of intellectual property rights in the world proves that we believe that there are things that you have rights or responsibilities because of simply by virtue of the fact that you created it, even if it's not technically ownable. So you have the Machne Chaim who says, we learn from the Gemara about forbidding non-Jews to learn Torah, and that being considered Gezel, that intellectual property is a property and therefore can be stolen. Rishim and Shkab says, no, it might not be property. But there's this notion that if you create something, in a certain sense, it is yours, even if it's not ownable. And he says that in the, the Gemara has cases of liability, but copyright and intellectual property is a case on the positive side, where the creation of, of said property um, grants me rights and a certain level of ownership over it. So that's model two for today in terms of understanding intellectual property. Okay? Model three will bring us back several hundred years, all the way to the Ramah. Do we want to break up again in Chabrusa, or do you want to try these models together? What's the... I'll ask you each time. What's the vote? Do you want to try again? What? What? Okay, fine. So let's try this one together. Okay. So, the Gemara in Baba Batra introduces the laws against illicit competition. So the Gemara says, Ambar Rav Huna. Rav Huna says, Hai Bar Mivo'ah. So, um, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to see it yet, but in the time of Chazal, property was normally arranged in houses opened into courtyards, into a chatzer, courtyards opened into alleyways, into a mavui, and then those alleyways opened up into public thoroughfares. Okay? So basically, the point is that... Um, your house was several stages removed from the the public. There's a there's a, a traffic control essentially built in, right? That right slowly but surely as you get to the private houses, you have to right you minimize the number of people that would ever bother walking on that street, and therefore there's minimal traffic. Okay. I see our Tarantonian stepped out for a moment, which is a shame because where'd she go? I don't know where she went. It happens to be that in Toronto. Uh, at least there's one of the major centers of the Jewish community, which is exactly north, right north of Toronto, is Thornhill, um, is actually structured this way. It's actually built this way, right? Um, by an Orthodox Jew, um, but basically in exactly that way, where everything opens, right, from the public street into a slightly smaller street, into a smaller street, into courts, which open into smaller courts, right? Essentially, it is, it is built uh, that way. And when I was learning Erevin, um, I actually spent the time to read a, uh, a thesis from, uh, from Ryerson University on, um, on the urban planning of Thor- Thornhill to understand um, Erevin better. It was written by the, the, the president of the shul at the time, his son-in-law. Um, but that's how it, it's structured. So the Gemara says, Let's say someone in the... This uh, alleyway, right, this series of courtyards opening to the alleyway is a mill, uh, a miller, right? He grinds flour. And someone from another alleyway comes in and tries to set up shop. The law is that he can stop him. The Amar because he can tell him, because he says, you are cutting off my livelihood. And then the Gemara says, um, the Gemara then gets into the exact parameters of this. And really the Sugi goes on um, extensively. You just missed, right? I was describing how Thornhill is basically the structure, the same way the Gemara's houses are, where it's multiple layers removed, right? Each, you know... It's main thoroughfare opening into a somewhat not as public thoroughfare into a somewhat less, each one diminishing the, the flow of traffic, right, which is, you know, 
I, I know it's not the same way down the south. Thornhill is structured this way. Yes. No, it was... It was no. When I learned Erevin, I, I, in my head, it just looked like Thornhill, ex, you know, except there were actual courtyards. But basically, it was structured the same way. Um, and I, you know, do you, do you know, you know, what's his name? Melech Tannen's son-in-law, I think, Rin, Rindy, maybe Rin, Rin, something. He wrote his thesis on this at Ryerson on the 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 theory behind behind Tannenbaum's planning of Thornhill. It was planned by an Orthodox Jew. It's actually meant to be be this way. It's not like. Um, so I read his thesis in, in, when I was learning Yerevan. It's fascinating. Well, Did he tell the people he was designing it for? Yeah, yeah, no. It was actually designed to be traffic controlled, but with walking paths, because it was meant to be a community that was primarily Shomer Shabbos. And therefore, it's very hard to drive in Thornhill, but very easy to walk, because there are diagonal paths that cut through these endless circles of streets. Um, that, that was actually in the plan from the beginning. Um, and therefore, it, you look at it and it's like a perfect way of understanding like half of what goes on in Irvin, right? And I lived on one of these. Like, I lived in one of these, like, you know, on one of these courts that opened into another court that opened into a street that opened to another street that opened to the main streets. Circle. Yeah, exactly. I, I lived on Tan Green Circle, which opened into Springgate, which opened onto Atkinson, which opened on the, right? Which then intersected with Clark, which then intersected with Bathurst, you know? Yeah, it, it's Toronto. Whatever. Yes, I know. No, no, I know down south it's not like that. Down south is like more of a grid with some weird streets that don't seem to open onto anything. Yeah. Like Meadowbrook, which I can't quite figure out how you're supposed to get onto because it doesn't open from any normal street. Yeah, things like that. Um, fine. So the Gemara's exact parameters of this are complicated. What, uh, what, right? Who is allowed to compete? Who's not allowed to compete? Neighboring, t- neighboring, um, Alleyway, neighboring city, and then halakhically, this is very complex in modern psak. Meaning, how, what does this look like in a modern world where um, everyone shops online, and therefore, you know, can you say that two clothes shops that open next to each other are suddenly that's the competition when realistically the real competition is Amazon or you know whatever whatever the case may be, right? Meaning when when Amazon is you know, when, when Jeff Bezos is worth whatever he's worth, $200 billion, right? Because, you know, everyone realizes that if they don't want to go to shops, they can just buy everything on Amazon. Can you really say that there's such a thing as competition, right? That one store is really the competition to another, right? So it, it, it's very complicated, modern, modern psak. But, be that as it may, the Gemara does have this notion that something that colloquially, though not correctly, is called a sagat vul, the encroaching of borders, but technically is, um, as the Gemara calls it, right? Someone's allowed to say to someone, kapasakta li chiyuti, you, by opening that business, have cut off my proper, have cut off my potential for profit. You've destroyed my business. And that, under certain circumstances, again, with all types of qualifications, which we can't get into, because I had to share it on its own right, it was actually one of the first year of my game in Toronto, um, was on this question. It was a very interesting year because it was specifically whether there, this is a touchy subject, but you only understand, you only you'll understand why this is. Whether there are, you can limit competition between Kasher's organizations, right? Which was, it was a, I gave it at, at Zeifman's, and as soon as I finished this year, so at Zeifman's they have Mincha, and half the Mincha are people from Zeifman's, and half of them are people from the office next door, which is the COR. So it was a very interesting uh, thing to give that share. Then the source sheet was sort of lying around. But um, the Rama in number six, in one of the earliest discussions of copyright, suggests that this is the real reason to recognize copyright, which is it's not about ownership, it's not even about quasi ownership. It's simply that when someone creates something, that's their business, right? And if you usurp it, so at, there are these notions that if you unfairly open a business, an identical business, right, uh, two pizza shops next to each other in a case where by opening the second one you will crush the financial viability of the first one, and basically all you have to offer is a second pizza shop, Right? Again, it gets complicated. What if you can offer the same thing for a better price or a better quality thing? Right? All that is complicated. But in this case, that's not it. You're offering the exact same thing. You're just they're stealing their ideas. So the Ramah says, you learn from the prohibition against, well, call a sagat vul, that it's prohibited to 
steal someone's idea because that's what you're doing. They invested all this time and effort and now you're destroying them financially. And that's why it's prohibited. So he writes in 6, The number one reason he thinks it's prohibited to violate intellectual property is this Gemara here. He says, That if one person is a miller and a second person opens up a mill in the same place, he can stop him. Right? Even though he already established his business, you can stop. something. That's lit, lit didn't, I don't know what that is, right? But something having to do with the printing. I don't know exactly what that's supposed to be and what language that's supposed to be. Um, it's actually said basically that's what's happening here. Right? You're trying to print the exact same book, his book, and sell the book so that people won't buy it from him because now they'll buy it from somebody else. And that is definitely damaging his ability to run his business. And therefore, the Ramah's suggestion, and the Ramah has many suggestions, but this is one of his suggestions, is um, that the reason to respect financial, uh, intellectual property is because of our obligation to not destroy other people's business by replicating their business in a place where it competes with them. Right, so that's model three uh, for today. So to recap what we've seen so far, this, today we've seen three. We've seen the position of the Machane Chaim based on Stealing Talmud Torah, that intellectual property is real and can be stolen. The position of Rav Shimon Shka, based on the Gemara Baba Kama, that creating something makes it yours enough that you get certain rights from it, even if you don't have real ownership. The Ramah, who says, no, the reason to respect it is because by copying someone's book and selling it as your own, or even not as your own, but just selling it, without him getting profits, you're destroying his business, and that's a problem of Asaka Gvul. And last week we saw the two models from Rizal Nechemi Goldberg. Um, one is partial sale, right? What we call shiur, rather than uh, tnal. Um, right, the notion that I can somehow sell sell something and retain the rights to not let you copy. And the third, mo- the second model from him was hana, was that sometimes simply the fact that you benefit from that which is mine. Um, entitles me to payment. So those are five models respecting intellectual property. Now, Rev. Uh, Naftali Barilan, in his article responding to Rizal Menachemia, so he said, look, I don't agree with Rizal Menachemia, as we talked about last week, because, as he said, look, you have hundreds of years of people writing about intellectual property, and no one ever came up with the idea of Shior, and no one ever came up with the idea of the Hana principle. But, what he does write is, it's clear that at the end of the day, even though there may be some differences between these different principles, it is obvious that we do honor some notion of intellectual property because, as he said, if you have in every generation postkim trying to come up with some reason to defend it, so you have two possibilities. Either you look at it and you say, this proves that halacha doesn't really recognize intellectual property because no one can put their finger on why it should be respected. Or you could go to the opposite extreme and say, look, it may be hard to figure out exactly why, and maybe the exact precise details will be in question. But the fact that every single POSIC comes up with some way of defending it shows that everyone believes that that has to be the case. And the truth is that in one of the most classic chuvot, this is really the formulation that you get. So one of the most classic chuvot on this topic is from Rochelle Nathanson, in the Shoah Umeshiv, in number 7, where he doesn't even explain why it's true. He takes it as a given that if the whole world recognizes intellectual property as something real, then we should also. And he writes in 7, A new book that a wise person publishes. Shidvara Mika Blin Api Table, that everyone loves it, accepts the words. Pshita, it's just obvious. Shiesh Lo Schut Bazel Olam. 
It's obvious that you have rights in this forever. He thinks forever. Right, definitely someone else can't do it without his permission. Um, it was known about this printer that his whole life he used the printing machine, right? The machine, right? If you didn't know what that was, mem alif shin yud nun machine, right? Machine. He used the machine his whole life, the printing machine, and that's where he made his money. Vilo, and here's his line, and I, I once heard this from Russia Weiss that he said basically the approach. And this is really a fascinating approach to modern Psach in general. Shoal Meshiv said, look, my approach to this is I may not know why, but I know that it exists. You know why? Because if the whole world assumes that this is real, the whole world thinks it's immoral, it's just wrong to not respect intellectual property, the exact parameters they can argue about. But every culture in the modern world has some notion of intellectual property and copyright and trademark. And everybody gets angry about the fact that there are certain countries in this world that seem to not respect other people's intellectual property, uh, you know, systematically. Read China, right? People get angry about that because it undermines productivity in the rest of the world, and people are upset by this. If they, the whole world has a moral, legal perspective, then that has weight. You have to, a post has to look at it and say, if everyone believes this, and it makes sense, right? It's not like it goes against a Torah value. You don't know what it is, but everyone universally has this intuition that this should be the mor- right, the moral principle. This should be law. Then, as he says, Lo It can't be that our Torah isn't worth everything they say, right? If they, if the whole world believes it, the Torah has to also say something about it. The has davar. And he says, it, this is just what we do. We give new authors and their families rights to the book. Because that's the right thing to do. And what you see from the Sholem is that he may not be totally sure why this is. But he actually thinks that a relevant factor in understanding new issues is to start the assumption that a moral, legal intuition in the world is something that we should take seriously. And therefore, Barilan picks up on this and says, look, in the end of the day, I disagree with Rav Zalman Nehemiah's two new formulations. But I do agree that at the end of the day, the fact that every po- that every Bozeg has their own reason for this and struggles to find some model... and. Again, these models are very different. Some think that intellectual property is real. Some think it's not real, and yet come up with models to explain why you still maintain rights to it. It's forbidden to violate those rights. You have to pay for those rights. Again, they argue whether it's us to use it, or you just have to pay if you do use it. But the fact that everyone, in the end of the day, does realize that there's value to it, is halakhically significant. For the Sholem Eishev, Basically, his conviction was, well, the whole world recognizes it. And when I heard a share from Russia Weiss, Russia Weiss basically said the same thing. Right? He said, look, as one of his three stars, he gave three arguments for why you should respect um, intellectual property. And these were his arguments. One is, as he said, svara. It just makes sense. And his argument was very simple. Very, very simply. He said, look, how many people actually think that it makes sense that it is worse to steal an apple than it is to steal the ideas from apple? All right, that was his way of putting it, right? He says, we all know an apple is like a quarter, and apple is one of the most lucrative companies on the face of the planet. And he says, you can't Look at that reality and tell me, yes, if I steal an apple, so then I am a thief. But if I steal all the ideas from apple, right, or right, take advantage of whatever, and I 
rob them of the potential of hundreds of millions of dollars that one of those is real, that the stealing the apple is real, but stealing apple's ideas are not. That's not a plausible conclusion. And therefore, Russia says, it must be that Allah uh, recognizes it. His next argument was, Minak Hasokharim, is that even if you don't think Halacha intrinsically recognizes it, in a Halacha, at the end of the day, there's a principle that whatever is the norm in the business world, we are bound by as long as we function in the business world. It's called Minak Hasokharim. Right? Whatever the custom is, it is. Right? And therefore, he said, look, even if you thought that internal to halacha, it wouldn't be recognized. At the end of the day, this is recognized, and it is standard business practice. And if you're functioning in that business world, then you must recognize it. But his third and most fascinating argument for me is the following. There are several midrashic traditions that say that what was the sin of stone or the, ma- or the Dor HaMabal, which is good, we're talking about it this week. I think I gave you the source from the Mabel, but there are other Midrashim that say the same thing of stone. What was so terrible about their sin of Hamas? Right? The, the Pazuk says that, that the Mabel, the world was destroyed because of Hamas. So what is Hamas? So the Midrash suggests as follows. If you, it, it's very small, so I'm going to read it here. Ezu Hamas Ezu Geza. What is this Hamas as opposed to real theft? That the world was destroyed for. So, Omar Rabbi Chanina, Hamas eno shaveh pruta. Vigezel shaveh pruta. They said, theft is when I steal something that's worth a pruta, which is the minimum amount of money that counts in halacha. Hamas is when I steal less. And why would I steal less? Because it's not enforceable. And therefore, what happened? Kach ayu anche amabel osim. This is what the sin was of the people of the flood. There would be a, a vegetable seller. And what would happen? Each person would make sure to steal, let's say 25 cents is a pruta, 20 cents worth of vegetables. Why? Because he couldn't take them to court. But everyone would do this. It was a culture. Hashem said, you did badly, you did wrong, I'm going to do wrong with you. And Arashar said, what does this Midrash teach you? What does Hamas? So he said, what's Hamas? So you could take it in a limited fashion, which is Hamas means stealing less than a Shavar Pruta. But Arashar said something I thought fascinating. Arashar Weiss is one of the most important posts in my life today. Okay, I, I, I love Arashar Weiss, he lives in Yerushalayim. Um, he said as follows. Hamas tells you that if I do something that's not technically theft, but if everyone in the world would do what I'm doing, it would destroy somebody financially. It's not theft, but it's Hamas. And he said, violating intellectual property is therefore Hamas. Because think about what you're doing. If you download a song illegally, so you may not destroy that singer. But if the whole world chose to download songs illegally and not legally, then it would destroy the singer's profits. That is Hamas. Hamas is something where what I do personally may not have such an impact. But if everyone would do what I do, even though you can't quantify what I'm doing, the net result would be the destruction of someone's livelihood. That's Hamas. And Rav Asher argued that's why halacha recognizes intellectual property. That's why you can't download you know, a book illegally or a, or a song illegally because, in the end of the day, you may not be the, per, the person responsible. You may not even be, it may not even be prosecutable. But neither was stealing 20 cents from the vegetable seller. But if, as a group, everyone goes and steals 20 cents, they'll have nothing left. And that, in the end of the day, is the insight, the moral insight from Chazal that he believed is behind intellectual property, is this notion of Hamas. Right, so in the end we've seen, I don't know, eight models, right? Um, that all, and again, there are differences between them. Um, right, there are some people who say that, yes, we recognize intellectual property, but 
only if you might have actually bought it, right? But if it, you're, you're just, right? If you would never buy it, you'd never spend money on it, so you didn't get hana. That makes sense if you talk about hana. But it might not make sense in other models. In the end of the day, if it's theft, it's theft, right? On the hana model, maybe that doesn't count as hana. Right? And then there's the question of what's fair trade, right? Meaning, does halacha actually think, even though technically according to copyright, like I can't copy my Gemara for myself, right, for private use, right? It says even for private use, you can't use it, right? And halacha, that may not be true. And halacha, it might be, look, I can copy a page of a book for myself, right, to read later on. I just don't want to schlep the book with me. I might be allowed to do that, maybe because I'm not losing money. I wasn't going to buy another book, the whole, right? Maybe in Allah I can do that, right? So obviously there are details we'd have to get into, but the notion that it is recognized for one of these seven, eight reasons, right, you see that the post can, some of them think it's really owned, some of them think it's about benefits, some think it's about destroying business, some think it's just the right thing to do, some think it's because of the, the cumulative effect of not recognizing um, intellectual property that makes it binding, it's Hamas. But all of them believe that we have to have some language. And again, there are differences between these formulations. The parameters will be different. The implications will be different. Yeah. So maybe too big of a question right now. But what about when the original rights holder no longer makes the name? Right? So it's something like Song of the Sound, which Disney doesn't sell anymore. You can only get what? Song of the South. Song of the South? Yeah, it's a Disney movie that was like, features, you know, the happy slaves and so forth. Oh, okay. So Disney doesn't sell it anymore, right? So right, so that's a good right. So that's an interesting question, right? So if something right is no longer being sold at all, so then you could say, well, if you held, let's say, Rizam Nehemia's model, that it's she or so you'd say it doesn't matter. He has the right to withhold ownership from it. So then you would say you can't do it, right? But if it's about Hana'a, you'd say he's not benefiting. He is banned benefit. No one will ever get benefit. So presumably, you would be allowed to because no one's making money off of it. Right? So that might depend on these formulations, right? And same with Hamas. If you think that, or, or the Ramah, right? The Ramah thinks I'm destroying someone else's livelihood. If they've chosen for ideological reasons to not make it public, but are no longer trying to make money off of it, so then according to many of the models, you might be allowed to do it. Right? But if you think that they retain ownership over it, so then you might not. And that, it might come down to exactly this question. Right? So like I said, the parameters, these models do matter because of questions like that. Right? Um, but this, at least, I hope gives you a survey. There is one more model, which is obviously, which is um, the number eight here. Is the Beit Yitzchak? I won't read it inside, but basically, the Beit Yitzchak says, you know, that in the end of the day, we have to remember, and this is that you know, even if we even if we decided halacha didn't recognize it, we would have to recognize it based on dina de machuta dina. Right? That there is a pr- principle that at least in most or certain monetary laws and maybe other laws as well, we have to follow the laws of the country we're in. And therefore, if the law recognizes copyright and intellectual property, so we have to as well. Um, now, that's not a super interesting position um, because, okay, meaning then you're basically saying this is not an intrinsic halakhic argument. It's just a case where halakha recognizes the input of an out- external system. But it, what Rav Asher Weiss noted it is interesting is that philosophically it is the opposite of the Sholem Eishev. Because what was the Sholem Eishev's argument? If the whole world believes that this must be right, Halacha must have something to say. When a posik like the Beit Yitzchak says, eh, I'm not convinced, but la Halacha you have to follow it because of Din the Malchuta, what are they really saying? It doesn't bother me to say that the whole world has a united moral front. I'm happy to say halacha says nothing about it, and you're only bound to it because everybody else says it's usher, right? And you have to follow the law of the land. Now, the end result might be that it's usher, and yes, there'd be nafkaminas because then it would be illegal in whatever way it's illegal legally. And dina malchuta may not be only about the law in the books; it may only be about enforceable law. So it might depend on how much is actually enforced rather than what's actually on the books. There are important reasons to think about Dina Malchuta. But Rav Asher pointed out is that what's striking about the Beis Yitzchak is that even though his conclusion is that we have to recognize intellectual property, the fact that he's willing to vacate the, the um, responsibility to come up with internal halachic language shows that unlike... Right? He doesn't share the 
moral intuition of the of the Shoal Meshiv, which is when the world says something, Halacha probably said, agrees, and we just got to figure out why. And he doesn't think, he doesn't give that credence to the, you know, the joint moral voice of the world. And that's interesting, right? Methodologically speaking, it's interesting that he's willing to do that um, and really claim that, yes, the whole world believes it, but we don't, right? We only do because... We have to follow the law of the land. Even though the result might be almost the same, though it might not identical, um, it, it's a totally different intuition about what we're supposed to learn about the halachic system by studying what's happening around us. Right? You have, again, you have the Shalom Meshav who says the whole world recognizes halacha must recognize it. I'm not sure why, but it does. And then we can suggest all these models. And then you have a post like the Beis Yitzchak who says, well, yeah, you have to respect it because the law of the land, but I don't feel compelled to say that halacha intrinsically recognizes it. Right? Those are two very different models. And, and if you think about it, um, this can happen in a lot of different areas of halacha, right? where there will be post who say, look, if there's a law or a consensus in the world that I think makes sense and seems moral and seems right, then that creates an obligation, intellectual obligation on me to look back at halacha and say, does halacha have language for this? That's one intuition. Then there are other people who say, look, I take the evidence as it is. If I can't find a model that compels me, then I have no problem saying that halacha is at odds with the entire world. Those are two very different approaches to halacha. And that type of attitude can really have implications in many, many areas of halacha. So it's important to at least name right, this reality and these intuitions because of their implications that might have in other halachic areas. Okay, so that is a survey of uh, seven, eight approaches. <laughs> I don't know how many approaches we did. Um, I hope this model worked a little bit better. Minimal sources, break up in little chavrusas, conversation. I hope it worked better. Yes? No? Yes? Okay. Okay, so I'll try to that, you know, I'll try for that next week. Um, in the time we have left, do we have... Uh